I was just like being, oh, thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. See, heroes do exist. <laughs> oh, gosh, that reminds me, you guys, sometimes when I'm driving on 405 and uh, the carpool lane, like to report people, it's 1-800-HERO. I'm like, that's our definition of a hero is reporting the... Maybe, it just depends on how you see it, I suppose. Maybe I'm a carpool lane violator, and so I feel offended by the idea of that being a hero. Okay, moving along to actually why I'm here, uh, and that is to give announcements for this week. Um, first of all, we have our, we're continuing with our Cedar Way and our Vision House um, donations of items throughout the summer. And we are kind of upping what we're doing because this is kind of cool. Sad and cool. Um, here's the sad part of it. Some of the sites were not very well supported, um, and so they decided through the summer to shut those down. But our site is very supported, thanks to you guys. And so they have asked us to just kind of up what we're doing. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to be serving 50 families instead of 35 is what we traditionally do. So through the summer months, that's what we'll be doing. And it's our regular stuff like carrots and potatoes and onions and toilet paper and anyway there's a list and um, if you notice in the lobby there was a thing that says you can text this keyword to this number and we will give you the sign up for that and there are a few items still left um, especially for Vision House some of the Afro hair care products they're actually pretty expensive they're like 10 bucks a bottle and so it just takes more of us working together we don't provide 50 obviously because not every family that comes through is in need of that but we like to offer that to them so pretty cool and I'm just so grateful for all that you guys are doing to keep that going. Um, but also the Nourishing Network, the Edmonds School District, they are providing meal boxes to families that have been identified as um, either homeless or food unstable. Um, and they don't want to stop that food through the summer months. And so we're packing boxes, and then those boxes are getting delivered throughout the week to those homes, doorsteps. And so we have some packing parties, is what we'll call them. Um, it's this Tuesday and then the following Tuesday, the 13th and the 20th of July from 9 o'clock till noon. And I know many of you are back at work, and that doesn't work for you. But for anyone who can, we'd love to have you. It's just kind of a good time. Trevor's there and Trevor is the life of a party if you haven't been around him and so um, let me just say you want to go there and, and like be celebrated because like let's go that's that's the the Trevor way so um, if you can do that would you mark your online communication card let us know there's a little bit of paperwork that you need to fill out in order to do that because you're on a school site um, to do that at College Place Middle School so um, our online communication card is found at W www.brookviewchurch.com forward slash contact. And for those of you that are at home as well, and that is a great way for us to hear from you. And we love to see that you're here online and we miss you and we're excited for the day that we can all be together again. Um, and then I just want to welcome those of you that this is your first time this morning. We are continuing to see more and more people feeling comfortable um, being here. And just we want to say we hope that this place and space is comfortable for you. You can move around here however you feel comfortable doing. If you want to jet out right at the end of service so you don't have to touch anything or touch anyone, no one will judge you for that. Um, we just are so, so happy that you're here. Um, and we found our own seats today. Day. This means our restrictions are gone, but you are free, free, free to continue to wear masks and create social distancing for yourself as well. Um, I'm done. Jason, get up here. Hello. Hello. So because my wife just commanded me to get up here and I'm, you know, rebellious towards being commanded to do anything, 
I, um, I'm going to start with a little gen right here, which is I'm going to verbally process. So I got up this morning to work on my message and was working on it and all that, and got up early to do that, and I cut myself shaving. And it was fine all morning. It was actually fine for a couple of hours until like 10 minutes before church, and then I nicked it. And so I think I have it under control, but I told Kate, if it starts bleeding, if I'm in the middle of preaching and it just, there's blood coming out of my face, tell me. And so here's what I would want to say for those of you women that are tenderhearted and rescuers, if you happen to have a little Band-Aid in your purse, uh, and you could just have it on standby, on hot standby, uh, if things go horribly awry, we'll just pull that thing out, button this thing up, and go. Amen? All right, I've been a little distracted. Normally, I like to sit in here and worship and not be like trying to get <laughs> blood off my face. But so let me pray. God, I just uh, thank you for everybody that's here this morning, everybody that's online right now, everybody that might be online later. And God, I believe that you, you love us so deeply and you want to speak to each of us individually um, in a way that is so personal and yet so true to your word. And so this morning, God, I pray that you would, you would do that, that you would meet us in this place because... Uh, we long to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I, you guys, I want to begin with kind of a weird question today. And here it is. Um, don't answer out loud. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, that was for you. Um, here's the question. Are you a great person? Yes. <laughs> oh. He doesn't like to be commanded either, apparently. Okay, all pride aside, let's think about you. Okay, are, are you a great person? And when you think about that, it's kind of a tough question because that's, that's kind of broad and like what's the criteria? And, and so um, like you might be great in some ways and not others. And so where do you draw the line? And so let me, let me break this into a few smaller categories. Are you a great friend? Not so much like how many people would call you their friend, and I'm certainly not talking about how many friends do you have on social media, but whoever considers you a, a real friend, like a legit friend, are you, are you a great friend? Are you a great mom? Are you a great dad? Like if you have kids, are you a, are you a great parent? Great mom or dad? Are you a great son or daughter? I mean, if your parents are alive or, or even if they've passed, were you or are you a great son or a great daughter? Are you a great neighbor? I mean, would the people who live near you, if I went to your house and I went to your, what would they say? Are you, are you a great neighbor? Are you a great employee? Are you a great boss? I mean, for those of you that, that have that role, are you, are you great to work for? Or how about this one? Have you, have you achieved great things? Have you had great success in something, anything? And here's a horribly awkward question. A am I a great pastor? Yes. Thank you, Brian. If you're a great person, no, it wasn't, it wasn't even you. You didn't want to answer on that one. <laughs> That's awkward. So, so we're in this series called The Way of Jesus. We're thinking about Jesus and his way. And today... We're going to think about greatness, um, and we're going to look at some of Jesus' most famous words about greatness. And for many of you, these are very familiar words, but here is my question for you in them. Do you understand them? Like, do you really get what Jesus is saying here? And then, do you, do you live it? I mean, as, as a follower of Jesus, are you great? Like, what would that even look like? And if you're not someone who's a follower of Jesus, then, then think about this. If you decided to become one, is it something that you think you could be great at? Because maybe you, maybe you look at the whole thing and you just go, uh, you know what? I don't think I would ever be great at it because I'm just not that kind of person. So as I read Jesus' words on greatness, I just want to ask you to kind of ponder a few questions in the back of your mind. Well, the first is what, is, what, what about his words is comforting to you here? But what about his words is confusing to you? And then what about his words is kind of unsettling to you? All right, here we go. This is, what is this? 
Matthew 18, 1 to 9. Here we go. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Good morning. Welcome to Brookview Church. <laughs> uh, like Human beings are, are social creatures. Right, like from top to bottom, we are created in the image of a Trinitarian community that we call God. In other words, we, we were created for relationship by a God who is relationship. And, and this is why the social isolation of the past season, I think for many of us, was so dang hard. And it's why the division that simultaneously accompanied all of it made this season even that much more unbearable. We were designed to live as human beings in the image of God, to live in a thick web of life-giving relationships, to live in interdependent community with one another in love. But the truth is, while, while every human being bears the image of God, every human being is also tarnished with a degree of brokenness, right, of sin. And in this past season, like the social isolation, it did crazy stuff, didn't it? I mean, people, people did and said crazy stuff. Many of you guys, and I know it, you lost friends. Like either they cut you out or they cut you off or they went a direction that you just couldn't go. Some of you lost long-time relationships, and it was a very, very painful time for you. In, in Jesus' teaching on greatness, it all centers around community. It all centers around promoting a healthy web of relationships. And I think that, that this is something that we need to think about and hear now as much as ever. So let's go back and work our way through this kind of thought by thought. Here we go, verse 1. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Put another way, which one of us is the most important or has the most status or is at the top of the social hierarchy? Like when you take over as king, Jesus, which of us is going to be your second in command? And then when you're gone, who do you think might be your successor? Which of us will be the greatest in your new kingdom? Verse 2, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. Now, the word here for little child is exactly that. It is very, very young. So don't imagine like a 10 or 12-year-old, okay? Envision like a toddler. And this child would have likely been probably somewhere right around two years old. And he placed the child smack dab in the center of them. And this little person is now an object lesson. I can imagine Jesus with his hand on this child's head and kids looking at him and he's just object lesson. Okay, here we go. Verse three. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so with this child standing right there, Jesus essentially says, you are asking which of you is the greatest in the kingdom. Guys, unless you change and become like this little child, you won't even be able to participate in my kingdom. 
you will miss out on the life God has for you. See this little one here? You have to become like this little child. Now, it is very easy to misinterpret Jesus' teaching here because in our like late modern Western culture, we romanticize children. You know what I'm talking about? So we, 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 we will have to talk about the wonder, the joy, the creativity, the, the innocence of children. And while all of that is true to a degree, have you ever met a two-year-old? <laughs> they can be very selfish. They can bite and hit and throw tantrums. They, they call each other names. Our, our culture tends to romanticize like the essence of, of children. But in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, this was not the case. It was a culture, as many of you know, that it was hard as nails. It was hard on children. It was hard on women. It was hard on the poor. It was hard on the disabled. It was hard on anyone who was vulnerable, including children. Like there was no Hallmark company romanticizing kids in Jesus' world. So before we turn what Jesus is saying into some like childlike attribute, Okay, before we pick like innocence or creativity or wonder or joy and we decide Jesus must be saying to be like that, we have to read this through like a first century lens. Jesus' point is not that we are to copy some sentimental childlike attribute. He's saying that we are to take on the status of a child, which in the first century was almost as low as you could go. It was right on par with with servants in a house. Verse 4, he says, Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now, the word translated welcome is just a reference to hospitality. And it it was used for how you would treat like a very special guest in your home. You would treat a special guest, right, with great honor. And Jesus is saying that not only are we to change the direction of our whole life trajectory and not spend our lives chasing honor for ourselves, but we are to look for ways to give honor away to others. We are to welcome those of lowly position and be kind and generous to them and treat them with great honor as if they were Jesus, as if they were Jesus himself. So imagine with me for a second that you could like be transported through a time machine or something back to first century, and you, and you had a nice home, and, and Jesus came to town, and in the evening, you found out Jesus is coming to your house for dinner, Jesus Christ, right? How, how much would you like go all out for that? I mean, how much energy would you put into that? Like how generous, would you be stingy with your food and drinks? Well, well, Jesus Jesus goes on. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble. Let's pause right there. A couple things to notice. First, notice that there's a progression in the text from little children, verse 3, where clearly he has in mind a toddler or a little boy or little girl, like literally, to one such child in verse 5. So something like a child to one of these little ones, those who believe in me, in verse 6. Meaning, the word child has now like, transitioned and become a metaphor for any and all who are on the low end of status in the social hierarchy of the day, and therefore are more vulnerable to harm. This could be a child in Jesus' world, or a slave, or a woman in that society, or in the church, it could be somebody that's newer to Jesus. Maybe they have a lot of money and they have a lot of privilege and they have a lot of power in the kind of world outside, but they're not solid in the faith and they would be especially vulnerable to being led astray. Okay, secondly, notice the word stumble. It says, cause them to stumble. And the word literally means to stumble or to fall. And so in context, the picture is to like fall into sin or to fall away from the faith. And Jesus says, if anyone causes that, get this, It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Wow. Jesus is saying that if you or I do something to betray the trust of those who have put their trust in Jesus, 
and cause them to sin or to fall away from God, it would be better to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Uh, A millstone was a large, like, heavy, circular stone that was used to grind grain. And it was so large that most of the time it had to be moved by, like, a donkey or a, a large animal. So the image is someone being dragged out to sea, to open sea on a boat, and a millstone is tied around their neck, and they are thrown overboard and drowned. You guys, it is graphic, violent language that theologian N.T. Wright called harsh words for a harsh reality. But let's be honest, it's, it's not that Jesus is cruel. Certainly he's not cruel. And it's not that Jesus is violent. He's certainly not violent. Far from it. So what's happening here? What's happening is that Jesus takes the exploitation of the weak by the strong very seriously. My mind goes to something like child slavery or child prostitution, or my mind goes to like corporate injustice leading to like sweatshops. And that kind of thinking is not, I don't think, out of line with what Jesus is saying here, but the context isn't just like abuse of power in the world in general. It's specifically about abuse of power in the church. Jesus' disciples are asking, who's the greatest? And Jesus is giving a graphic warning here. He's saying, if you seek power or status for their own sake, and if you step on people to get them, you guys, you'll have no part with me. It's not what my kingdom is about. So make sure you check your heart. You better be very, very careful. Jesus is saying people who seek status and power for themselves are dangerous. Eventually they hurt people both in the world and in the church. Sin and brokenness are still very much a reality in our world, so this stuff will happen. But Jesus says to his guys, okay, not so with you. Not so with you. You be different. Jesus goes on. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Okay, this world is full of brokenness of all kinds, but Jesus is saying, guys, don't let that brokenness come through you. Verse 8, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, okay, to fall away from me, away from your Father in heaven, away from the path that I'm trying to get you on, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is far better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. This is not a soft warning, right? This is graphic language that is intended to arrest our attention. But Within this, there is so much room for misunderstanding, misinterpretation. So first of all, let's be clear, this is hyperbole. Jesus is not instructing us to mutilate our bodies. Are we agreed? Amen? Because please do not cut off your hand or your foot. Please do not poke out your eye. He's saying that if you have something in your life, and it may very well bring some degree of pleasure or or good to your life, but if that thing causes you to stumble, to fall away from Jesus, or become someone that causes others to stumble, then even if it costs you, cut that thing out of your life. You will lose something in the moment, but the cost of not cutting it out is even greater. And what is that cost? I mean, is this saying Jesus is going to send you to hell? Well, I mean, if you turn from Jesus, you miss out on his kingdom. You miss out on participating in it now and in the future. If you turn from Jesus, it's no small sacrifice. His words are intended to seize our attention. But we need to be careful not to get too hung up on the hell language here. Um, The word that's translated hell here is, in Greek, it's Gehenna. And Gehenna was actually a very real, very literal place in Jesus' day. Okay, everybody knew about it, everybody knew what it was, and everybody knew where it was. It was just to the south of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is built on a hill, and Gehenna is in a valley just to the south of it. And many historians argue that in Jesus' day, the valley of Gehenna was actually used as a garbage dump, and fires burned there 24-7 to consume the waste of the city. 
It's a very real place. So Gehenna became sort of a metaphor for Jesus. And the things that became waste, you know, of things that are become, become waste kind of get thrown on the fire. They're burned away because they have no value. They have nothing to offer. They're not useful for producing good things. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus uses the word Gehenna with regularity, and he uses the image to describe the opposite of life in the kingdom. But, but in Christian and even like broader culture today, many people have a very skewed and limited view of both heaven and hell. Uh, many see them exclusively as like destinations after death. So you live on earth, right? Which is neither heaven nor hell. And then when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. And it's only after death that you could possibly experience either of them. But when we take that view, it makes so much of what Jesus says in the New Testament really confusing. And, and if you were here at Easter, we, we talked about all of this. Heaven is actually, through Jesus, now available to us, in a sense, on earth. Uh, but also, hell is very present right now on earth. And, and, and so, this is what we said at Easter, Jesus came to get the hell out of earth. Right? Jesus came to make the kingdom of God available to all, not just in the future on the other side of death, but right here, right now. So uh, at Easter, I showed a video from the guys at the Bible Project. And I want to show it again this morning. It's six minutes. If you saw it before, enjoy it again. Um, because I think the idea that's portrayed here is so foundational, and it's so relevant to the words of Jesus this morning. So, uh, okay, let's, let's roll that video. I love this Bible project. Here we go. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the, the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin 
when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. You guys, the story of the Bible is it's absolutely breathtaking. And the story of the Bible is that Jesus is up to something amazing And you and I are invited to participate in it. The the kingdom of God is actually here now, and we can begin to live within it if we wish. But to do that, what Jesus is saying is, we need to become like a child. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying that as long as you are driven by an obsession for status, you cannot participate in what God is wanting to do both in and through you. We have to let go of of all all that's broken inside of us and this desire that, that we have to step on others so that we can rise above them. And guys, this desire, this it's inside of all of us. And when we let it have the best of us, it, it, it unleashes hell on our world. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a story that I've never talked about with you. And uh, I don't even think I've talked about it with my kids or Jen or anybody. Uh, something that I did and something that I, I deeply regret. It actually it just makes me cringe. But it is exactly the kind of thing that Jesus is condemning here. Um, Okay, so when I was in middle school, go back, and now you're envisioning seventh grade, middle school, Jason. Uh, I was a very, very insecure kid. I had zits and braces, and it was tough. And, um, and I was utterly consumed with trying to ascend in status, like just be cooler. And so it led to a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear and doing a lot of really jerky things. You ever met a jerky middle school boy? Okay. So what I want to tell you about one of the things that I'm like most ashamed of in that season. 
we had, so one day after school, uh, my best friend and I were about to walk home, but in front of the school, there were some boys playing like touch football. And my friend and I, we were football players. So I played quarterback. He was a defensive end and he was a big hitter. Um, so there's this football game going on in the grass in front of the school. And there's this kid that's just standing off on the side watching. And his name was Jeff. And he was a nerdy, red-headed kid with glasses. And he was not a football player. He was not an athlete. I, I, I didn't really even know him. But he was just standing there watching, probably because he was not invited to play, because my guess is nobody wanted him on their team. So my friend and I, now we were not the most popular kids at school, far from it, but we were a whole lot more popular than Jeff. And he, like on the middle school status ladder, he was bottom rung, okay? So Jeff had his back to us, and uh, my best friend kind of elbows me, and he says, I'll hit low, you hit high. And he sort of nodded toward Jeff, and then he just took off sprinting toward this kid that was just standing there minding his own business, watching other kids play football, probably feeling left out. And my friend took off sprinting, and so I ran alongside of him, and we had like 30 feet to get up to full speed. And my friend put a blindside, vicious blindside hit on this kid on the back of his legs, and I hit him in his like square in his back, and we just dumped this kid over in the grass, and his backpack went flying off. His stuff flew out of his backpack. And so then my friend bounced up, looked at me. We high-fived and walked off. Some of you are like, I can't go to this church anymore. <laughs> I know. I've tried to tell you. I've done wicked things. You're like, no, you're up. No, really. This may have been the meanest thing. I'm just flat-out meanest thing. I've ever done. And it's so weird because I didn't really even know the kid. Uh, he had never done anything to hurt me. And, and so I've kind of reflected back on that, you know, for years and years, just like, oh, man. And it has kind of haunted me. Like, and it's a little self-reflection. Like, why in the world did I do that to that poor kid? Just innocent kid. And when I think about it, like, I think he was okay physically. Like, he was shocked, and he was kind of banged up, but I don't think there was, like, permanent physical damage. But what, what did that do to him emotionally? Why would I do that? So I've... Like, just replayed that over and over in my mind and just been like, what in the world? Like, I, in a moment of absolute stupidity, unleashed hell on another human being. <clears throat> I want to say, outside of that, I was not really a bully. Uh, but I did that. I really did that. And so where in the world did that act come from? And here's what I think. I think it was all about the whole status thing. Just asserting status. It was brutal. And what I've realized is there's some dark stuff inside me. There's dark stuff. It's in there. And the point of Jesus' evocative language here, and it's like really sharp. The point is to shock you and me, the listeners, to see the darkness of the exploitation of the weak by the strong. When the strong assert their status, Instead of using it to serve, it unleashes hell on earth. Many of you know that in the ancient Near East, it was like what we call an honor-shame culture. Everything was about kind of your status in the social group. And for most people, life could simply be summed up. Think about the Roman kind of Greek, Greco world. It could be summed up in this way. It's just an attempt to increase my status in other people's eyes. That was like the totality of life. But the reality is you don't have to come from a culture like that to feel this because even today there is a constant negotiation going on to increase our status in the group. Like in our culture, there are thousands of examples of this. There's how many followers you have on your social media platform or the status signal of your clothing 
or your watch, or your car, or your neighborhood, or your purse. Right, ladies? I don't get it, but God bless you. You know, it's where you went to school, or the prestige of your job, or how, just how cool you are. It's how well-read you are, or how much you've traveled. And the attempt to increase status, it just it's, it can play out in, in like infinite ways, right? It's all about growing in our standing in other people's eyes. But to do this, and here's the dark side of it, the really dark side, to do this as effectively as possible, most of us also, even, at an un, even if at an unconscious level, we have to somehow decrease the other people's status. We angle our way up the social ladder at the cost of someone else. It could be as simple as like one-upmanship in conversation or talking over top of somebody around a table or like a playful kind of sarcastic dig that's just well-timed or a whole lot more egregious stuff. But here's the thing. When we play the social Darwinism game, whether it's on social media or at work or in our friend group or at church, it happens at church. It's only a matter of time until somebody gets hurt. And Jesus in this teaching is saying, don't play the game. Just don't play the game. If there's pressure to play, then exercise non-cooperation. Just walk off the field. Jesus says, turn and go the opposite direction. Okay, now I want to say something really important here. It is not wrong to want to be seen, appreciated, valued, or praised. Like sometimes we hear Jesus on humility and we sort of get the wrong idea. He's not asking you to be a doormat and just get walked all over. He's not asking you to not pursue goals. He's not asking you to not apply for a job that has, you know, a limited number of positions or to try to get into the college or make the team or any of that. He's not asking you to make yourself invisible. He's not asking you to feel bad about achieving or or being noticed and enjoying it. I came across an interesting idea kind of in prepping for this message, um, and it's this. Developmental psychologists argue that like self-worth for a child is only a function of unconditional love. This is what we think. It comes from unconditional love, right? But it is only a function of unconditional love from birth to about age three. After that, it seems to result more from contribution to a social group. Meaning, for a child to feel happy and content, at first, they just need unconditional love from mom and dad. Like, you know what, little thing? You can't even live on your own, and so here's love, and here's affection, and here's food and shelter, and we delight in you, and we praise you, and we talk to you, and we pay attention to you. Children need that God-like kind of unconditional love. And it provides for them in those early years a really solid base. But it turns out that that in and of itself is not enough. To feel happy and confident, to have a positive sense of self-worth as they age, they need, like for their own well-being, they need to contribute. They, like for me, uh, I, like I know people that came from really large families or, you know, people that have, maybe you've known people that have like grown up on a farm with tons of chores to do or, or their parents had a small business and they had a role to play and they helped out or whatever, but they actually had a real way to contribute. The people that I know that grew up like that tend to be the most joyful, content, and emotionally well-adjusted people that I knew. They just are. Whereas... Children who experienced a ton of unconditional love, but only ever in the form of receiving, not contributing. So like, you know, daddy saying, hey, let's go for a daddy-daughter date or whatever, and let me buy you ice cream, right? That's a really good thing. That's a really beautiful thing. But for children who that is the totality of their experience, they just receive and receive and receive and take and take and take, and they don't have any responsibilities. They don't make any contributions. Very often, they grow up to be unhappy and even neurotic. Why? Well, because we were made by God not just to receive love, 
but to take that love and then give that love away. To become a conduit for love to th- like flow right in and through our body. It comes from God to us and goes out. It comes from others, goes to us and goes out. We're to be a conduit. And the sooner we find real ways to contribute to others, the happier and the healthier we are. One of the things that I've, I've loved about raising kids with Jen is watching her work. And if you've been around her for years, Jen is like a kid whisperer, right? I mean, I watch her with little kids, and whether it's just like one kid, a two-year-old or a six-year-old or whatever, where it's a large, huge group of hundreds of kids, she's so stinking good. And, and part of, I think, what makes her so good is that she understands kids. Like, she understands human nature and then how that gets expressed in little people. So um, two weeks ago, we had, uh, we had the heat wave. Does anybody remember the heat wave? Okay. And uh, so we had an event here called Ignite, which in the middle of a heat wave is a terrible name, is it not? <laughs> and so next door, we have, for that event, we have the kids next door so we can be a little more adult with that. And so we had a babysitter for the kids. And we were like, oh my goodness, because lots of people came and lots of kids came, more kids than we were kind of anticipating. And so right before Ignite started, Jen went next door to kind of get things settled and get the kids all squared away. And a brand new babysitter, first time here at Brookview and with these kids. And, she, you know, she didn't want the, those, that babysitter to get eaten alive by your wicked children. <laughs> Uh, and so she went over there, and, um, and, and so she got over there, and, and she was looking around at the situation, and she just did kind of some quick thinking on her feet. Um, and so she, was, she called the kids over, and she was like, okay, guys, um, I want you to raise your hand if you're in third grade or above. So then the, she's like, okay, guys, you guys are the older kids, and and there's a lot of new kids and a lot of younger kids here. And so I need you older kids to be special helpers. I need you to really watch out for the younger or the newer kids. Make sure they understand how we behave here and, and how we do things around here. And make sure that they feel included and, and they have a friend. I, I need you guys to be leaders. Okay, not just to think of yourselves. You're not just here for yourself, but to think of others. I need you guys to be like special helpers. Can you guys do that? And of course, the kids are big nods. Like, we can totally do that, Jen. We're big, you know. And so from uh, the moment she said she needed help, there was one little boy's hand that shot up, and he was going berserk. And so... Is he still in the room? Awesome, perfect. I can talk about him. <laughs> okay, so he, his hand shoots up, and she's like this the whole time that she's explaining all this. And finally, finally, Jen says, okay, Cooper, you've been very patient. What is it? He says, well, I just finished second grade, and so I'm not going into third grade until next year can I still be a special helper? (laughs) Jen's like, for sure, Cooper, come on. You're a great helper. I've seen you help a thousand times. You're the man. You're such a great helper. You're going to be perfect for this. I enlist you. You are going to be a wonderful, very special helper. Okay. Now, Jen told me later, we got home. I wasn't there for any of this. And she was telling me this because she was so impressed with the kids. But she said it was the most amazing thing for the kids. They all, they all took this like, call to lead and serve others and contribute very seriously. But she said, especially Cooper. Um, she says, now Cooper has kind of this intense little personality. And so as soon as he was enlisted, she said he literally stuck his chest out. And he was like, all right, what are we doing? And so Jen was like, all right, well, there's a lot of little kids here. We don't have enough chairs. We need a bunch more little kid chairs. And so she said, Cooper, he like went to work. So he, he went in and he was grabbing stacks of chairs, you know, like as many as he could possibly get. And he's like trying to carry him out of the room. And, and he's looking at Jen like, do you see me? Right? And Jen's like, oh, you're so strong. You know, he's like, oh, let's go. So, and he'd smile at her and then be, go back to being intense. And so he just took incredible pleasure in contributing and being noticed of having an adult say 
Well done, Cooper. Right? That's awesome. You're great. So let me just reiterate. It's not wrong to want to be seen, appreciated, valued, or praised. You guys, one of the reasons, I, I'm going to let you in on something. One of the reasons I decided to be a pastor was so I could contribute. I want to do something with my life that really matters. And, and at certain times over the years, I, I have, it's like I have felt my father say, well done, my son. With you, I'm well pleased. Right? Like, well done. And then on top of that feeling, sometimes I get feedback from you guys. It could be an email or a card or a text or a conversation, but you guys will just kindly, you guys are some of the kindest people on earth, will just gr express gratitude for something. Be like, hey, Jason, thank you for that thing you did, you know, the sermon you gave or the counseling that you gave or the opportunity that you gave. Like, I just want you to know it really mattered to me. It made a difference in my life. And so thank you for doing what you do. It matters to me. And you guys will not believe this. But I love that stuff. If you're thinking about doing that, I want to encourage you. <laughs> now, does that, is that like wrong of me? Does that make me like an egomaniac? I, I don't think so. I, I think it makes me human. And it turns out, little Cooper isn't the only one that likes being a special helper. So to end, let's just circle back to the disciples' question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Notice that Jesus does not rebuke the desire for greatness. He just redefines what greatness is. You notice that? Guys, we are all born with the desire to be great. Or to put it another way, a desire to matter, a desire to make a difference, a desire to contribute. None of us just wants to just like take up space and, and it, like as another carbon footprint, right? We're, we're born with a desire to leave the world better than we found it. I mean, think of the, the like mythology of our culture. And yes, we have, we have tons of mythology, like stories that, that shape us. Think of a movie like Star Wars, like with Luke Skywalker or Rey, right? Or think about Frodo from Lord of the Rings or Spider-Man with Peter Parker or Simba, the Lion King. We, we kind of, it's the same story. We love this storyline, like a woman or a man or a lion gets born into obscurity, right? Or poverty or pain and yet rises up to do something amazing. And usually what happens is they discover a mentor. It could be a mother or a father or some other mentor. And then they go on a journey of self-discovery and sacrifice. And they face conflict and pain and suffering and challenge. But in the end, they overcome and they change the world. We watch movie after movie after movie after movie. And it's the same plot line. We read novel after novel after novel. It's the same story again and again on repeat. We can't get enough. Why? Because that's the human story. It's the human desire to be great, to contribute, to give, to matter. But the desire, that desire that God sort of put into our DNA is also co-opted by brokenness, by sin. And as we age, we have to find a way to face the brokenness inside us. And some try to numb the pain of desire with more and more pleasure, right? It's just like, let's just make as much money as we can and let's just enjoy life as much as possible. And the thought is, I will feel better when I, when I have access to more pleasure. And so the turn then is inward. The turn is towards self. Others feel the brokenness inside and, and just sort of let it consume and corrupt them and they become willing to do anything to anyone in the pursuit of status. But either way, sin has mutated the image of God in all of us. So what Jesus does here and what Jesus says here is genius. 
He, he doesn't rebuke the disciples or you and me for our desire to be great. Instead, he redefines what greatness is. And here's the beauty. Let's go back to our question at the beginning. Are you great? Here's the beauty. Jesus turns greatness into something that is accessible for all. To any who are willing to come to him and apprentice under him. Doesn't matter, no matter your family of origin, no matter what culture you were born into, no matter what time in human history you were born into, no matter your, your strength or your weaknesses or your personality type, all of us have the potential as an apprentice of Jesus to become great, by, but by his definition. Where it's, it's not about status, it's about service. It's not about high, how high up you are in the hierarchy, but how humble According to Jesus, you guys, all of us can become great. We just have to be willing to become like a little child. Father in heaven, I thank you for just the unconditional love that is showered out on each of us day after day after day. Just the reality that, that you love us more than we can possibly imagine. And you see within us beauty that is, that is often just untapped. You see what we can become. And you are relentless in inviting us toward you so that you can cultivate that and develop that in us. And God, I just pray for all of us that you would, that you would help us to see this life that you're calling us to as a life of freedom as a life of joy, as a life of, of love and, and fantastic relationships. And God, would you help us this week and even today as we, as we walk out of this place to think about how can I serve those around me? How can I love them? How can I contribute to them? Not just be thinking about the people that are far off, that are broken far away, but, but our children and our parents and our brothers and our sisters and our spouses, the people that are right there with us. God, would you teach us more and more to serve and would you help us more and more to become great, to just become great in your kingdom.